the complete crew. What started on the island with over 20 participants taking part slowly whittled down to a group that saw only a dozen members defeat the overseer and ascend. With the exception of one individual... Oh no, Blue. What did he do? The rest of the tribe was able to ascend from the island map on Alpha. The complete crew is getting smaller and the daunting task of completing each map and starting each time with only the levels that you have earned has proven a task only few can endure. Those in the company still hold true to their commitment, but will the desert break them? Or will they pull each other through the mammoth task of defeating the Ark and all of its DLC? <laughs> There's a pile over you there. This is the story of the complete crew and their journey to complete Scorched Earth in under 100 days. Spawning in at South 1, the tribe has set a relatively safe rendezvous point on the flats. Once again, the whole crew has decided to ignore my best locations guide to Scorched Earth, they tell me, and opt instead to set up on the flat dunes. Joke's on them because in my base location guide, in at number 6 was the flat dunes. And if they'd bothered to have watched my video, they would have no- As soon as I spawn in, I'm already at the rendezvous point. I meet up with Shazella almost straight away after spawning in at the base location. I perhaps spoke too soon and cast bad luck on the entire tribe when I opened my mouth to utter these next words. James, okay, okay. we made it straight away. We just spawned it. This has got to be the easiest start I've ever had to uh, scorch death. No sooner had I said it and we noticed a lightning wyvern oh, at our base. No. Right tribe mate Vax and Cat struggling to run away from a beast nice. which was a long way from home. <laughs> oh, I'm, oh I'm dear. On top of this. Myself and tribe mate Shares do all we can to support her by hiding behind a statue and laughing at her. The complete crew have no choice but to lure the most dangerous of all the dragons away into the desert and hope that it doesn't come back. James, I blame you. The tribe's first priority is food and water, but most importantly, shelter. The tribe begin to gather the basics. There's a water vein close by for now to sustain the tribe to begin with and after the dragon was lured away from the base the tribe rapidly begins to get the basics together. A temporary shelter is erected to avoid the desert's first obstacle, the weather. By about midday the crew's gathered enough resources to place a roof and bed down and most have basic clothing and primitive weapons. After the heat wave passes and a rudimentary campsite is established the tribe forms into smaller groups for a short time. Myself, tribe mate Jaybird and Vexing Cat all band in together to head off towards the local mountain in hope of gathering some metal. Come here, Pug. Damn it, Pug. I was gonna check and see if there was. Oh, Muckaraptor? Yeah. Muckaraptor. Yeah. Oh, sorry, mate. Uh -huh. Did I oh, did I bowl you? <laughs> sorry, mate. Who oh. pissed off the um Don't know how I got pissed off. Here you go, Jay. Do we have any um I'll make some archives? Hello Bruh! Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh. Where did that come from? Oh no, and I'm crafting. I'll take it this way. Alright, okay. Let me split in. The carno just come out of nowhere. <laughs> No! Oh no! 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 Try and get to I'm you. very close. Oh! Come in here. Is it worth me jumping down there? Um. Hang on. Well, What's that? Is this, there's an uh, there's an algae. Yeah. <laughs> By the dying light of the first day, the complete crew have tamed little more than a few jaboas and a pegomastix. The ongoing construction project has pillaged the immediate area of what's useful, so we venture out further to gather what we need. I spot a solitary Morellatop skulking around the outskirts of the woodland area I'm heading to. Alone, these creatures tend to flee rather than fight, so repeatedly bashing them over the head with a boomerang will knock them out quicker than One Punch Man defeats a boss. While waiting for the creature to tame, I fill its inventory with wood. And on my return to camp, I can see our new bastion is starting to take shape. For the time being, the complete crew have earned a rest.
onto a swift sunrise and a complete crew's main objective today is to obtain some crystal and a means to haul it. The crew has gathered enough metal to equip each member with a set of primitive tools. And towards the afternoon, a caravan of Morella tops is formed for an expedition. We bring trank arrows and taming pens on the few animals that we have and set out in search of riches. We don't have to wander too far from base when chance brings an Argentavis our way. Tribe mate Romeo quickly constructs a taming pen for it and hello. an old friend jumps back in to say hello as we're getting set up. Having set up on high ground, he proves to be of no challenge and serves as an enticing meal for our unsuspecting Argentavis. The bird's caught with relative ease and its level is poor, but with our first bird tamed, we can fly off to gather a little crystal for the camp's spyglasses. With a little crystal hauled back to the base, tribe mate Vexing Cat brings more birds back to the trap. Just laid it down and begun. It's flying off to you. Oh no, come on in here. There you go. It's in. By the late morning of the third day, another Argentavis is tamed and brought into the fold. These avian powerhouses are crucial for hauling large amounts of resources across the map, and the sooner each member has one, the faster we can progress. The two birds we have are not the greatest levels, so much of the third day will be spent acquiring more of them. By the time I return to base, the crew has gathered enough resources to craft a complete set of desert attire for everyone. At this point, the tribe operates like a well-oiled machine, and runs faster than a whippet with a bum full of dynamite. After a quick pit stop and a resupply, I'm straight back out into the desert's blistering heat for a spot more bird watching. I grab a level 110 Argent and drag it back to the trap, with tribe mate Romeo waiting to knock it out. And the crew's found a level 145 Dodic with a food stat so large that had it been tamed on the island and accidentally dropped into the ocean, it would have caused a tsunami. One more reasonable stat bird is added to the group, and now with the selection of birds that we have, we can begin to breed. By the afternoon of the fourth day, fertilized Argentavis eggs have been laid. I've constructed a makeshift hatching area, which serves its purpose for the day. As long as the first person to imprint the creature is its intended rider, any tribe mate can continue the imprint. So I continued the day calling out names and delegating mounts, and the rest of the crew continue with other tasks. For any players who are unfamiliar with how the mechanics of Ark's breeding work, then here's a few things you need to know. First, only one player can imprint a newborn, but after that, any player can give care. Second, assuming the creature gets 100% imprint with all its care needs being met before turning an adult, we gain an extra 20% on all of its stats, excluding both stamina and oxygen. Any player riding this creature will benefit from its base levels, but, and here's the important part, the player who first imprinted the creature, when they ride it, it gets an extra modifier, giving the creature an extra 30% outgoing damage and taking a reduction of 30% incoming damage. So taking all of this into account, if you're not bothering to do any of this, then your creatures are about half as effective as any of the complete crews. The final tribe member to get their bird is Marleybeg. He was happy to raise his own mount as it was getting late, and I welcomed the break. Yeah, I'm on it now. He's taking you for a ride, isn't he, Marley? <laughs> Ridiculous. Ridiculous is what you should call him. Glad you got explosive and not me, mate. I would have shot it. I can't I can't hmm. believe how, how long that uh, yeah, Marley's been walking be, this for now. It's like. got to be bugged. I'm going to switch it out. Ah, oh, don't give up now. <laughs> it's never bugged out you wait it'll be oh. i've never had one that <sighs> like just didn't tame up in the end you'll probably sing it and then it'll say it wants exceptional kibble because it looks like <laughs> <old> to me <laughs> by mid-morning of the fifth day i finished off an imprint on my own argentavis fortunately he's a huge contrast to the one we ended up with on the island map we called the illegitimate chonking cat, and we can finally head on out and explore. With transports of crystal and metal being pulled in, myself and tribe mate Vex go on a hunt. Vexing Cat places a training trap down on top of a spire close to a Phylacolio spawning area, and I for some reason drag over a max level saber tooth. 
It has 27 points in damage according to the awesome Spyglass mod, which is one of the few mods we use in this playthrough, along with a stack mod. I find it hard to leave any potentially good max level creatures, but I know I'll never use it. I'd personally tame a pack of walls rather than the saber. In spite of them not requiring a saddle and lacking the armor, I'd take the pack bonus any day. Both pale insignificant next to a good file of Collio, and if we're going to find one, Scorched Earth's the place to do it. After knocking out the Sabertooth, we returned to a hunt during an afternoon heatwave. It was then I spotted my first Phoenix. It didn't return to Ash, and perhaps it was a glitch in the Matrix, and tribe mate Vexing Cat was clearly unable to see this magnificent creature, and was lacking the vision that laid before me now. Why am I not seeing it? You yeah, you're flame not saying it. it's right here, right in front of me. It's just sort of stuck in the air right now. Yeah, we're right above it. it. Uh, Struggling now, alone against death, and unable to rest on the ashes of its nest, the phoenix. In times of doubt and confusion, it symbolizes strength, transformation, and renewal. For only from the ashes of who we were can we rise up to become who we will be. I'm pretty sure that that's the message that Dumbledore gave to Harry Potter. But regardless, I mark the site with a billboard telling tribe members that I have been given a sign, and the whole tribe has a new purpose. But for now, we must continue. I do like the colours on that, actually. Um, this main, main colour is white, that's why I like the white. Yeah. White and blue. White and turquoise blue. The desert is cleared of low-level Phylacolio spawns multiple times, and a level 100 is the best that we managed to come up with. Perhaps it just managed to make the cut as it had the colour that I was so fond of, but it's then that we see a high-level Tech Rex, with a serious case of pink eye, and with 36 wild points in weight, taming it could very well upset the gravity on the Ark itself. Should enough points be randomly assigned into its weight points from here, it could start a chain reaction that could end up destroying all the seed projects, leaving humanity's last hope squarely in the hands of the Genesis Protocol. We recklessly continue to play with all survivors' fates and hopes, condemning them forever to play the mindless missions like Zero-G Bulldog Basketball or the ever so popular Space Whales Shootout that thankfully Wildcard forces you to do over and over and over again. Yeah, we tempt fate, sorry everyone. With the risk of breaking everyone's arc, we tame it. And as predicted, it got a high base weight. 48 points and she's indeed a heavy girl. She doesn't quite break the laws of physics, but does indeed have a bad case of pink eye. An ailment that can be transmitted to other humans if you fart on their pillowcase before bed, but it's still unknown as to what she sniffed before we tamed her. The complete crew was getting stronger. More gathering and hunting was needed, but the path that laid before us was clear. The Phoenix was the key to all of this. The tribe awakes with a jolt in the morning's stormy gloom. Our deus ex or overseer perhaps senses I have been chosen to tame the Phoenix, and in anger sends out white jagged angles of light to disrupt our electrics and divert us all from our main objective. Water and pipework was utilised from a river quite a distance from this position for a fully functioning cooking station. And it was at this point that tribe member Shiny B saw adventure in the Great Scar, wanting to be the first dragon rider among the tribe. The impetuous nature of youth, only on day six of the desert and she's wishing to risk all for a dragon, without ammunition or backup. I head on out towards the Scar to catch up, but as it turns out, she had a plan, and that plan was tribe member Romeo. Somehow she had managed to convince Romeo to help her. Carry on a bit further up and you'll see some rock golems and we're both naked. Tribe member Romeo has a method for taming rock elementals I ended up making a guide on. He'd already tamed two of them and here's me showing Vexing Cat that same knowledge. Just, uh, yeah, yeah. Now, now it's come back towards me, it's fine now. Perfect. And he's out. Knowledge, for heart and mind, hold the key to the greatest diploma. Okay. How did you die, Shiny? In the lava. With my gun? 
No. Good. <laughs> the knowledge to never give up on one's dreams, no matter how far they may seem away. <gasps> oh dear. Did yes. you put the bed down? Uh, the bed's still down. Knowledge of limitless potential, as wondrous and vast as the universe is. Oh no, shiny, what happened? Ah, <laughs> uh, I fell. That's not good. Why would you do that? I'm looking for eggs. That's not how you look for eggs, shiny. How I look for eggs. It's a fashionable view that teachers should not impart bodies of knowledge, but instead should act as facilitators or coaches. A demonstration of how to gather eggs effectively without dying is clearly needed. You grab it. Go, go, go. Quick. Get back. Oh no, I'm over encumbered. Who are you really? No, actually, I've. I just feel that I'm slow. Oh, there's one coming at you guys. Okay. There's one coming at you. Yeah, yeah, there will be. Yeah, that's it. Lead them into the... Lead them into pebbles. Come on, pebbles. Oh, shit. Oh. This is it. Now we've got an egg. This is an easy way to get them out of the trench, like, because you just swap it between your inventories. Yeah. Knowledge is wisdom. The intellect that sees us through and a philosophy that makes us choose the correct course. Do you know what? Never mind. Uh. Oh. Okay. It was on the eve of the sixth day that I slipped into a coma that I wasn't going to wake from for a whole weekend. The last thing I remember was an alpha wyvern. During my sleep, I had visions of an aberrant cave. I was flying as if I had wings of my own, like a giant hawk swooping down on its prey. There were even visions of a beautiful Viking-inspired map. It felt as though I'd existed in more than one arc at one time. And by the time I had awoke, it was late on the tenth day. All had changed. The complete crew was almost ready to fight the Manticore. Tribe member Romeo had received my message I'd sent through the oracle known as Discord Crew Chat, but he had misread the prophecy. He had tamed two phoenixes for the tribe while I was still in a coma. He said he did it twice to be twice as sure the prophecy was fulfilled, but he was mistaken. And as punishment, he's going to have to show me how he did it. Tribe member Vexing Cat took an early start to the day with myself, giving me a grand tour of all of the upgrades to the new base area. Tribe member Shiny B had created a very nice crafting area that was both quite good to look at and extremely practical. And tribe member Shizella worked extremely hard detailing all of the crew's quarters. Not even allowing the paint to dry and the concrete to harden on this new adobe build. And tribe member Chonk already has a bootleg operation going on in his back room. Tribe member Romeo and Shiny B have moved in together and I wasn't suspicious of anything going on between them until I looked back at this footage. You'll know that Shiny B clearly logs out in the single bed just before we walk into the room and I strongly suspect that she makes Romeo sleep there instead. On to the main designer of the crew quarters and Shazella's room. She's managed to get her cool dinosaur picture up but has yet had the chance to do any detailing. I must say I approve of all of the upgrades and we head on back to where the old crew quarters were. As it turns out, tribe member Jaybird is the only person who didn't end up with a room. Both myself and Vexing Cat have been given penthouse suites and it would appear that Jaybird has got this whole place to himself now. I believe he's quite happy and it's then that I spotted, unfortunately, Vex had forgotten her favourite so tame. Hey, hang on a minute. Blue. You've left your favourite. I did not tame that. It tamed itself. <laughs> yeah, that's it. You put it in this one right here. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> Order has now been restored. And on the agenda for today is cave-in. We're going to need artifacts to face off against the boss and the Phylocolios have all been bred and imprinted and are ready to take on the caves. It's required that each member takes part in the cave runs at some point in their playthrough. It's not always possible to be present at the same time so this is done multiple times but on the 11th day a fellowship of five tribe members goes forth to retrieve some 
on our newly imprinted Philocolios. They'll have little to be concerned about in a group so large, so first we head north to the mountains and the artifact of the crag. The artifact of the crag entrance is located in the northern mountains. Heading out from the Blue Obelisk on Ground Mount is a good way to find your bearings. Following the path that's naturally eroded into the mountainside, you will stumble across its entrance. There are no trick loot crates in here, so checking all areas can prove lucrative. And while we wait for more artifacts to spawn back, tribe member Marleybeg notices a loot location that none of us have found before, nestled in an alcove in a chamber just outside of the artifact's room. It can only be accessed by grappling hook. The phylocolios are too big to squeeze into a point so small, so grappling hooks come in handy and it's recommended that you bring them. Each member personally retrieves an artifact, leaving only myself, and we add five more to the pile. Since Wildcard's update to the phylocolio, adding the Nash ability, which I do approve of, the phylocolio is now a powerhouse, even when soloing. However, the fact that the rock and rubble golems are able to take bleed damage it's unbalanced the experience on Scorched Earth, which I don't approve of. Elementals do not suffer Wyvern Breath attacks, and I personally feel they shouldn't bleed. They're already slow and easy to dodge, they lack the ability to jump, and their primary purpose is to soak damage. Now that they can't, when it goes up against a Philo, it makes them unbalanced. Into the late afternoon and the crew head on out on a note run across the Dune Sea. We encounter a death worm, but unfortunately it's not an alpha. Members of the complete crew wishing to complete a full skin set of exclusive Scorched Earth Roman armor need to find and defeat an alpha death worm. And so far only tribe members Romeo and Shiny Bee have come across them. By the dying light of the 11th day, the complete crew head to the ruins of the Gladiator Arena. Behind the Manticore statue is a note from Rockwell, and in the center, a creature dossier from Helena, containing the Phoenix, which was still the complete crew's top priority. It's well known at this point that Wildcard didn't finish Scorched Earth. Despite the fan base asking them to, it's widely regarded by the community that this is where Raya led Rockwell and Helena to find the exit to Scorched Earth. She sought to rob the ability of the Arcs to reset themselves. What was the main control center for the Scorched Earth now being buried underground? I highly recommend the fan's cinematic ending by Falcrum Gaming if you've ever craved to see what it would be like. I'll leave a full link to the video down below. By the dying light out in the Dune Sea on the 11th day is when we stumble across the red loot drop that's going to perhaps change the fortunes of the whole tribe. I uncover a desert deep sea loot crate that could perhaps change the fate of the whole complete crew. An ascendant pair of scuba flippers and a pair of goggles. Tribe member Boss Chonk is very pleased as it will go very well with his ramshackle scuba tank and tribe member Vexing Cat's scuba leggings. As the sun rose on the 12th day of the complete crew's journey, practically invincible to any land-based creature the desert had to throw at them, besides the basic needs of food and water, and the dangers of the elements or being dismounted were the only things of any concern. The adventure had become more of a sightseeing tour around the ruins, as no member had anything to worry about in the safety of these numbers. The ruins of Nosti being the only cave on scorched earth with a bottomless pit could prove to be a wipeout for a crew member, but no mistakes are made and each crew member retrieves an artifact. After taking in the sights, we head to the final cave, deep within the desert canyon not far from our base location. When confronted with the last catacomb entrance with the remaining artifact, I'm reminded of a time before cryopods. The first time I ever entered this cave dying to a group of mantis on the other side. As frustrating as dying is, I much preferred the challenge. I used the Fjordor Lava Cave as a great example of how to keep your heart racing and the satisfaction that you get from accomplishing it. Now the caves on Scorched Earth are of no challenge. Upon returning to the base, Jaybird has constructed his usual breeding factory, and Romeo already combining the best stats we have on the Lightning Wyverns means technically speaking, we could all but level a group now and go and face the Manticore. Even without any mutations, the Manticore is fairly easy to beat now. No Rex Saddle blueprint is yet to be found, and these particular creatures would give the beast a run for its money with a primitive saddle alone. But for now, the offspring of the Rexes that we don't want will be used to level the creatures we do want, and the resources that the Tech Rexes give back almost make gathering metal an unnecessary chore. 
Harvesting the baby Rexes with a chainsaw yields quite a lot of scrap metal. And considering that one scrap metal piece equals one metal ingot, as opposed to two raw pieces of metal per one, after an afternoon of breeding, you can end up with quite a lot of metal. After a short time, electric components and oil will also build up, so just dino farming alone can be a good way to contribute to the tribe's wealth, and kills multiple birds with one stone, so to speak. The crew was almost at full strength, but one thing still remained, and no one was moving on from this map until I'd fulfilled the prophecy of taming the phoenix. series of unfortunate events that led to the start of this outbreak I take full responsibility for as tribe leader. At some point over the last couple of days, Shazella's poor battle wyvern had developed a horrible pink mutation in its skin, and we believe that breeding the tech rexes so close caused the mutation to jump over. A breakout of pink eye scurvy can be a serious problem if social distancing is not adhered to. Had I known the pink eye pathogen could be transmitted via different species, I would not have thrown caution into the wind last night by sneaking into Romeo's room to fart on his pillow. And being that he doesn't have pink eye, I can confirm that he doesn't sleep in the small bed. An unbeknown side effect of tribe member Shiny Bee contracting pink eye was to defecate admin and all-round nice guy Jaybird's room. Clearly she was suffering from some kind of side effect. Tribe member Vexing Cat was starting to worry me too. She kept losing consciousness every 10 minutes or so, perhaps early signs of pink eye. It was indeed quite frustrating for her. To keep her safe during these bouts of unconsciousness, we stuffed her behind the staircase to risk less members becoming infected. Perhaps it was already too late to stop the spread, and being that the tribe was ready to fight the manticore, waiting for me to tame the phoenix was only going to expose the crew longer. Romeo said our best chance of finding the phoenix was waiting for a heat wave and going out in search parties. Naturally, being under a time frame, we couldn't afford to waste a second, so I commandeered Marley Begg's two parasaurs. Something I hardly bothered to tame myself, but their ability to sense predators could help us narrow down our search. Taking one parasaur each, we scoured the desert meticulously for signs of the phoenix nest. I thought they would help us improve our chances, but the smaller ants would often show up, giving off false positives. It was like looking for a needle in a haystack. So then we get the good fortune of being out in a heat wave. The fact that we had combed half the desert with the parasaurs I feel helped narrow down our search. And in this short window of opportunity, Romeo spotted it in the mountains. By the time I got there, the heat wave was over, but our parasaurs could still see the nest. And now that we have the location, all we need to do is build a trap and wait for a heat wave for it to spawn in. We returned to camp under the cover of darkness, still wary of the lingering contagion looming over the tribe. I wait outside while Romeo gathers the resources we need. If I can tame the phoenix tomorrow, there's still hope we can beat the manticore before more creatures get infected. A fortnight into the complete crew's desert adventure and I could taste the finish line. Tribe mate Romeo constructs a trap he learned from Nooblets, and with two weeks having passed in the desert, the only thing left for the complete crew to do was tame me a phoenix. With the parasaurs showing off the location of the ashes, finding where to place the trap was not difficult. The trap design itself we use is based off Steve at Nooblets design, and we place it down not a moment too soon. With the Jaboa's warning of an impending heat wave, we hastily spread oil jars around the trap. And finally, on the morning of the 14th day, the complete crew's journey was almost over. As the phoenix spawns into life in a spectacular ball of flame, upon closer inspection, due to hastily erecting the trap perhaps, the phoenix has spawned lower than in the intended box. Placing the trap on a hill instead of a flat surface made it burst into life slightly lower than expected. We shoot at the jars with fire arrows, causing them to combust and engulf the phoenix. I could taste victory as its taming bar rapidly begins to shoot up, but my hopes are dashed like the fire we started when we discover the creature has escaped. We pursue the phoenix as it flees the scene, with myself and Romeo riding lightning wyverns, all we can do is keep track of it. It comes to rest on the side of a cliff and this time we build a bigger trap. We gather the resources to construct a makeshift scaffold 
and this time we're sure to take the time to make the trap big enough to catch the beast. Keeping the complete crew in the desert any longer than necessary is only going to risk exposure. It doesn't bear thinking about what the final fight could look like if more creatures catch the virus. So as not to run the risk of offending anyone in the tribe or my wonderful viewers here on YouTube, we dubbed the new strain of pink eye the Delta variant. Originally known as the Shizella variant, but singling out a person or place of origin when it comes to pink eye could cause political unrest amongst the camp. I play it safe and strive to remain totally unoffensive. By the following day of waiting for the weather to change the complete crew's fortunes, myself and Romeo construct a new and improved base. I raise a white flag on the rooftop signalling that we are safe from the virus. Out of sheer boredom, myself and Romeo make a parkour challenge. It turns out to hold our amusement longer than the missions on Genesis 2. Every time we failed the last jump, the overwhelming compulsion to try again was genuinely more fun than hunting Maywings with a net gun and under a time frame. And Wildcard, if you're watching this, feel free to take the design one step further. We both get excited for a moment when the Jaboas sense a change in the weather, his tail raising in the air with a zigzag means thunder. With little hope of a heatwave this day, we turn our attention to Alpha Deathworms. This time the Parasaurs acting as an excellent radar for hunting them, but we could only find the regular ones. Unfortunately, Romeo carelessly left Marley Begg's Parasaur unattended while fighting a Deathworm. Paul Will had proved vital in locating the Prophesy's Phoenix, and now was proving vital locating Death Worms. He needlessly perished, and I don't have the footage at hand showing Paul Williams' final moments, but despite what Romeo says in the comments section, it was his fault. All the events that have taken place here have been accurately portrayed, including the timelines. We only changed the name of the Shazella variant to the Delta variant to protect Shazella's identity and conform to political correctness, both in the desert and on YouTube. So Marley Beg, I'm sorry for your loss, but it was Romeo's fault, and you know I wouldn't lie or embellish a story for the sake of views on YouTube. It was late into the evening of the 17th day when it finally happened. Tribe mate Romeo had long since gone to bed, and I had matchsticks in my eye sockets keeping me awake. Vexing Cat, seemingly having gotten better from collapsing every 10 minutes, had come to keep me company. The new base of operations had been turned into some kind of vulture sanctuary now, and she wanted to get tribe member boss Chonk back for putting a dozen monkeys in her room back on the island. And being that I was Vexing Cat's neighbour back then, I wanted to get Boss Chonk back for putting a dozen monkeys in her room. Being more than prepared to tame the phoenix, having it spawn in the trap properly this time, Vexing Cat could look on in awe as the prophecy is fulfilled. I try to approach the creature to see if it's taming properly, and it's in this moment I'm careless. Stepping too close to the flames, I fall off the side of the cliff, falling to the earth like an asteroid crashing through the atmosphere. My first death of the playthrough, is certainly a memorable one. By the time I return to my body, Vex has tamed the phoenix. She's extremely proud of her new mount, having always wanted a mount that poops out pearls and cooks her food for her. I'm forced to carry on with her master plan to fill Chong's room with vultures, and upon returning to the base, we proceed to fill his room with them. She leaves a few on wander, so more breed, and I'm sure he'll be grateful when he wakes up. Feeling exhausted from the two days I've been awake waiting for the phoenix to spawn, the last thing Vexing Cat does is make me take a picture of her new bird. So she proudly names Joaquin. She says I'll always have a picture to hang on my wall of her phoenix, and I can pretend it's mine. She also says I can have some poop pearls if I bring Joaquin some sulfur. Apparently he likes that. And now that I have a picture, she says the prophecy is almost fulfilled. If we fight the boss now, she's sure that no harm will come to the crew. But I won't give in. This could be the last time I'm in this godforsaken desert, and the phoenix will be mine. Two more days pass combing the desert with our parasaurs, in one last ditch attempt at finding the phoenix in time. Luck would have it that Vexing Cat stumbles across more ashes in the June Sea, and a trap is promptly constructed, 
Using the same design as before, we encounter sandstorms, and we encounter lightning storms, and out of sheer boredom waiting for the weather to change, we make a new type of taming pen for the giant praying mantis. It does kind of work, but going out of render distance is required to passively tame them, but having a large trap to drop the mantis into did help somewhat and a design that we can perhaps improve on. 21 days into our journey and finally my last chance to get this right laid before me. A slight alteration to the trap was made, giving me more room to stand back from the inferno. And we're in business. I tame a phoenix for filling the prophecy. As Vex named her phoenix Joaquin, I named mine River after his brother. And as this was the end of the journey for the complete crew, all that was left to do was fight the manticore. As predicted, most of the girls' wyverns ended up contracting pink eye, and since Wildcard updated the wyverns, the manticore is no threat. Even testing this fight solo, the most we lost was one wyvern, and only because it was knocked out by poison and died to a rock elemental on the floor. The whistle commands in the arena are broken, as I suspected on my own completionist run. No control in the creature means other than the riders using their lightning breath. All the dragons can do is bite. This technically means that any type of dragon can be used in this fight. No blueprints are required for the saddles, so all you need to do to beat it is find one decent wyvern egg. A huge thank you to the complete crew for letting me roast them in these 100 days defeated challenges. They're honestly the nicest group of gamers I've ever had the pleasure of meeting, and hopefully after seeing this, they'll all want to continue on to aberration. And naturally, a huge thank you to my patrons scrolling up the screen right now. YouTube is almost impossible to be discovered on now, and only a handful of people will be shown this video. So I thank you all from the bottom of my heart for making YouTube somewhat worthwhile. And lastly, we leave the last words to come from Boss Chonk, who wants to send us all out with a rhyme about Fred. <laughs> my name is Fred. Fred, Fred Ned, Ted. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we change every time. I'm still dead. Woke up in the sand, skin burned my... Red. Oh, that should be head. Skin burn my head. Well, my skin burning red. Apologies, my skin burning red. Yes. <laughs> like subtle, you know. My friends ascended, I came here instead. The scorched hell fills me with dread. Very cool, mate. I don't think our journey ends here, mate. That's the thing. Oh, no. And, and I, I don't know by the end with the team that's left. We might even be a team that's possibly able to tolerate Genesis 1 and 2. There is good things about that map, there's creatures, there's things to do that I never really did. And it, it very much is meant for a small team, so it looks like there's six or seven of us that are pretty much a team. A huge thank you to Boss Chong for leaving us with another rhyme from Fred, and of course to all the members of the Complete Crew. Without their help, these episodes certainly wouldn't be possible, and I thank them for putting up with my shenanigans over the last couple of months. Until next time, I'm James from Complete Games, and I'll see ya.